But uh, yes, today we want to uh, again start in Matthew, the 19th chapter. I will get back to finishing the, the 12th chapter of Hebrews, but I felt led to share this message as I was studying this week. And so let's read through this passage of Scripture. It's a long passage, but I'm not going to parse every little thing out. Uh, there's just some general truths I want us to pull out of this. So let's begin reading, Genebeth, if you will put that up on the screen. Let's start with verse 16. You'll know this. Some people call him the rich young ruler if you have a, a King James Version. Uh, some just call him the rich young man. But it says in verse 16, And behold, a man came up to him, and that's Jesus, that Jesus was teaching here. He says, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? He said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go. Sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. But with, then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake, Name's sake, we'll receive a hundredfold. We'll receive, we'll inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last. And the last, first. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus, admitting we need your help to understand this passage of Scripture. I need your help to preach it and proclaim it. For people do not need to hear any foolish or stupid ideas that I may have, my own opinion. We need to hear what the Holy Spirit has intended when he inspired Matthew to, to copy down these teachings of Jesus and these experiences that he had while he was here on earth. And we want to glean from them what we should get from them. Uh, I pray for this congregation who is here as well as those, some who are sick and can't be with us today and they're listening or listen later uh, by means of uh, the internet. And we have others from around the world, our friends in, in Germany and Italy and Singapore and uh, California and uh, uh, Washington State, uh, Illinois, uh, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, the Northeast, uh, some of our friends up in uh, Idaho and other places. Lord, uh, people are listening. People, others right here in Texas, uh, people in Florida, we just, uh, people, people in Georgia. Uh, we know some are listening. We pray that you would meet their need and help them to get connected to maybe a, a church that's attending in person. But uh, meet their need now and use us to help them. Meet the needs of each one in this room and help us to apply your truth here. Have mercy upon us as we work to take a stand in the community. We appreciate what you're doing there. And uh, we will give you the credit, the praise, the honor, and glory, Lord. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. So I want you to know today's message has an application for the church member and the unbeliever. Now, notice something. <laughs> I didn't say for the believer and the unbeliever. I said church member and the uh, and the uh, the unbeliever. But also, not every church member is a believer. You know, let's face it. That's that's not the problem in many places. And you can be a member of a church, a religious group, and not truly follow Jesus. Uh, and there's a difference between being religious and being in relation with Jesus. Okay. So there are many who are on the path toward the kingdom of God who sadly fall short of it. And we'll see what this young man did. We can tell that by reading this passage. Many people are like the nephew of the ticket taker at the basketball scrimmage we attended yesterday. We attended a, a wonderful young man. Uh, this school was doing so much. They had 
I think COVID vaccinations going on, ACT exams going on. They had a basketball scrimmage that featured four schools that was happening. We had, uh, they had a baseball game going on. I mean, they were doing all kinds of stuff. But this ticket taker was a wonderful young man who uh, I told him, well, I'm going to come in here. I'm still working on my sermon, and I'm going to watch this and take a few notes. And he said, well, I got something for you. You know, I think I might can help you. I got an illustration. So I didn't know if it would fit or not, but I think it does. Uh, the man who, uh, this particular man was eating breakfast and his four-year-old nephew was driving a toy truck on the linoleum floor and uh, the wheels came off the truck so the boy gives the, the wheels to the uncle and began playing with the truck. Uh, well, I, actually, um, the wheels came off and he gave the truck to the man and kept playing with the wheels but then it changed around and he gave the, uh, the wheels to the uncle and began playing with the truck. He later looked at his uncle and complained that the truck was not fixed. The uncle told the nephew that he had to give all of the truck to him so he could fix it. Okay? So total surrender to God is a path to eternal life. You can't surrender some part of your life to God and then not do the other. I know that some people will say, no, wait a minute. I was saved when I was seven years old. I didn't understand the full implication of surrendering to Jesus. No, but what you had, you surrendered to Jesus. Okay, what you understood, you did. You wanted Jesus to be your Savior and you surrendered to him. Uh, later, he showed you some other things to surrender. But at that moment, you didn't hold anything back. If you held something back and said, Jesus, I'll give you this, but you can't have that, you're not saved. I had a, a, a pastor friend, um, somewhat of a mentor, a, an older man who taught in my church as a, when I was a teenager. And he told about the night that he got saved. He said there was a revival meeting happening in that particular community. And it was one of those that uh, they not, only, not only had night services, they had day services. And it was a 10-day meeting. And he was in the altar every night and every morning praying and asking God to save him. And people would come up to him and say, Bob, you're saved. You've asked Jesus to be your Savior. You've told him you're sorry. But he said, I had a little bit of money. He could have everything but that. And I knew I wasn't saved. And finally, that last night, I said, God, you can have it all. And he said, God didn't make me give that money away. But I had to be willing I had to be willing that Jesus, my life is yours. I don't have any part of my life I hold back. It's all yours. I surrender myself to you. You are my, not only my Savior, but my Lord. And so, you know, you might see me telling this story. I started with the main point and said, well, I guess we can go home now. You know, you've made the main point. But, uh, and it seems that way. But uh, I want you to see today how many in the world think that they've surrendered fully to Jesus but they're giving him the truck and they're keeping the wheels or the other way around. They're giving him the wheels and they're keeping the truck. So let's look at the story of the rich young ruler or the rich young man and his encounter with Jesus and we're going to see how we fare when it comes to surrendering to Jesus. This is a message for you. It's not to look at, you know, don't think, well, I know Bentley needs to hear that. He ought to really straighten up or maybe Bo needs to hear that or Alyssa needs to hear that. No. Look at you. What did you need to do? How did you fit into this picture? So there's five questions that the rich young ruler asked. Uh, and actually, I think there's some questions that others ask as well. And let's see the answers that Jesus gave. So first question here. And again, almost home but lost. I don't know if some of you who like classic Southern gospel music may remember there was a song years ago called that. Almost home but lost. This fellow was on the right path. But he was lost. What good thing, he asked, shall I do? In verses 16 and 17. So listen, the young man had studied the law of God and his requirements. He was not an irreligious guy. He understood religion. He understood the Jewish religion. He understood what God required. He knew about the Ten Commandments. And sadly, all oh, between the time of the Ten Commandments and the other things that Moses gave, and by the time we get to the day of Jesus, there were 613 commands that had been written. And a lot of them were, well, they were just trying so hard to keep people from doing wrong. But, you know, they kept coming up with more and more commands, just like we do with laws. You know, we've got so many laws that I don't, I don't know how many of us have broken a bunch of laws today in this nation. Because there's so many of them. I mean, I don't know. Some of y'all might have accidentally torn the, the tag off your mattress. Ooh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a law. You're not supposed to do that. You'd be in prison for it. Uh, uh, now, nah, thankfully, they don't throw people in prison for that, but it's a, sort of a stupid law in a sense. So, you see what I'm saying? When everybody says, we need another law, I'm like, no, we need people with a, 
law of God in their heart that people would love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and the neighbor as themselves, then we really don't need too many other laws, you know. Just a few things to spell things out that are a little murky, but uh, we don't have that. But these young men had studied the law of God, but here's what Jesus says to him later. He comes up to the man and to Jesus and says, Good teacher, what must I do? Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? There's none good but God. So you see that in your next point there. None good but God. Jesus wanted the young man to realize that that young man was dealing with God. Jesus was God. Not merely a human teacher of the law. He was more than that. Than just a good teacher. Remember I've been telling you that it's not an option for you to receive Jesus as just a good man or nobody else to do that. Jesus is either God or there's nothing good about him. He's a nutcase if he's not God. I mean, what do y'all say to people that sit on the street corner, maybe you've been in some big towns where you could see people are maybe very mentally unstable, schizophrenic, uh, they think they're Jesus. And you're like, hey, you know they're not Jesus. You think they're touched in their mind, that they have a mental problem. And I have a great burden for people with mental problems. We're not doing enough to help them. But, but uh, yeah, Jesus is either God or there's nothing good about him. So this man is challenging that. Jesus is challenging that to the young man. So he says, what good things shall I do? And that leads to the commandments. Which commandments? He says, which commandments should I keep? Well, Jesus tells him, you know, keep the commandments. He says, which ones? Here's what happens. Christ told him to keep the law. Not because the law saves, but because we must be convicted by the law because before we feel the need to be saved by grace. So hear me out. I'm all for telling people benefits of Christianity. There's a place for that. But really, folks, people don't get saved until they understand there's a holy God. He has some commands, and they've not lived up to that. And I'm appalled at how many, even some pastors I've served with, that thankfully one of them, I was able to help him. And by the way, I didn't help him by dragging him aside and fussing at him. Okay? I had a relationship with him, and as he and I would talk about theology, he admitted to me. He said, I've been sort of known to just present the benefits of coming to Jesus. And yes, there are holy requirements God has. Um, let me ask if some we got a couple, by the way, uh, which, you know, Bentley's been playing basketball. But Genevieve made the 18 for seventh grade. All right. It's going to be a starting forward. All right. So that's her uh, first, and that's the first time she's ever started in anything because she wasn't my starter when she played with me in Upward. She was uh, my bench kid, uh, <laughs> my, my other bench kid that came off. I talked her into playing by telling her she didn't have to play very much. And, she could just work her way in there, and then we found out there were only six girls on every team. And I'm like, a 24-minute game, hey, you're going to play a little bit more than 10 minutes a game. You know? so, remember she had a couple, she played nearly all 24 minutes. So uh, she's probably thinking, Dad, you lied to me. You know? okay. But anyway, but in a game, y'all really want to play for a team that have any standards? Really? Y'all want to play for somebody that says, y'all just go out there and play and have a good time, do whatever. You've played for a team like that, hadn't you, Bentley? Coach, that, that wasn't fun, was it? How many games did y'all win that year? No, no. You didn't win any that year. None. None. Because Bentley and a couple of the boys, I eventually, I didn't want to go to overrun the coach, but I took him aside. A couple of boys said, you boys have played together. Y'all get together and come up with something. And another parent had said the same thing. Y'all get together between the three of y'all. Y'all are leaders and come up with something. I don't, this last game of the season. Ain't nothing coach can do anyway now. And I hated to sort of go over the coach's head, but coach didn't have any philosophy. That was just, hey, y'all play hard, go out here. A church can't be that way. A, 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 a true religion. And Jesus is more than just a religion. We can't just do that. And so we, we live in a world that says, well, we shouldn't be condemning people. No. I don't ever look down my nose at somebody when I teach the law of God. I know that I've broken it many times. So I don't, I don't do that. But we can't have this everybody just do whatever they want to do and God just sort of loves everybody. That's not how that works. It's not. And I don't be honest with you, there will be some people that hear me teach this that will not want to come to this church. Okay? You need to understand that. Please don't come up to me and ask me to change my message so it makes them more comfortable. Uh, what we do in churches today... What you win people with, you have to stick with. If you pander to everybody's little whims, Amen. I've been down that road. Amen. I ain't going back down that road. That's right. Period. In my life, I don't even do that in my life, in my daily life anymore. You, you know where you're going, where God is leading you. You stick with that. 
Okay, and everybody's not going to like you, and you're going to lose friendships at times. But I found I gain many more because there are legitimate people who really want Jesus, and I've got to offer them the real Jesus. There are many fake Jesuses out there, but the Jesus of the Bible loves people. We're going to see later that Jesus loved the young man. It doesn't, um, in this particular passage, it doesn't say it, but uh, it, in one of the other Gospels, it says Jesus loved the young man. And uh, he wasn't doing this to be mean, but... But we have to understand, we have to be convicted by the law before we feel the need to be saved by grace. And what was happening here is that the law was serving as a mirror. If you go to James chapter 1, verses 20 through 25, you will see that the law of God shows us the mirror. And we look at it, it's like, you know, have you ever had a time you thought you looked real good and you got in the mirror like, man, that's, you know, I, I was happy that somebody gave me a compliment the other day. The young lady that I did the video with, uh, out on Highway 61, it has a little boutique. Uh, I was very shocked. She said, uh, I was talking about how, yeah, I'm in my mid-50s and I'm having to work on trying to be healthier because this knee that's bothering me, some of that's come from a tight hamstring. I didn't know that, y'all. A tight hamstring can affect your knee. It can actually cause your knee to be pulled out of position. So I've been trying to get back and ride the exercise bike, getting up and stretching every night, trying to stretch these muscles back out. And I said, I know I look old. I've looked old for a long time. She said, I said don't say that. Because she said, I'm 51. And I'm like, no, there's just no way. She looks like she's about 32, you know. And she later said that, yeah, well, my husband's 10 years older than me. And everybody thinks uh, he's my dad. And I'm like, well, that's, he may look 61, but you don't look 51, you know. But I'm a person that, um, so I get in the mirror, though, and I'm like, yeah. I, when I lived in South Florida. I didn't take care of my skin like I should have. I got out in the sun and did things and didn't treat it right and now my skin looks bad and I just I've looked old for a long time so I'm not as surprised anymore when I get in the mirror I'm like sometimes I'm like well I'm better than I thought I did you know but uh, but sometimes we may think that hey I think I'm looking really good and we get up close and I remember the day that I got up and said wow my eyelids are real droopy I think where I had gained and lost so much weight over the time that uh, I'll probably at some point have to have cosmetic surgery not to look good but just so that my eyelids stay open you know uh, you know i might start nicknaming me sleepy because I, I have to really sort of open my eyes wide sometimes to uh to see as well as i should so but that law serves as a mirror it shows us what our real need is it shows us that we can't keep the law of god and so that's a bad thing well that's a good thing because it shows us where we find the answer so here's what, this is what happens. Here's, here's the, ne the man's next question. The young man asks Jesus. He says, which commandments Jesus tells him. And he, you know, he goes on and um, you know, he says, you shall not murder, commit adultery, not steal, not bear false witness, honor your mom and dad, love your neighbor as yourself. And um, so um, the young man says, well, I've done all these. I've kept this. What do I still lack? That's our third point. What lack I yet? Well, well, notice the dialogue there that we talked about in Jesus' straightforward answers. We see that and we'll see the refusal of the young man. See, there were six commands listed that the young man had said that he kept. Now, the command for the Sabbath wasn't dealt with because it wasn't so much a moral command, it was a ceremonial command. But this young man probably had observed that too. I mean, if he was such an upstanding young man, probably, he probably went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. But there were three other commands that Jesus left out here. You know that the Ten Commandments, I think it's what, five of them are more toward our relationship with others and five toward God. And I won't have these quoted, but first of all, you will see God alone. God alone must be the one that we serve. He must be the supreme person. You shall have no other gods before you. You know, uh, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You know, uh, we are to have one God. Okay? There were to be no idols. None. No idols. And then there's no misrepresentation of God. In other words, that's what the idol was all about. That's what these, we're not to make any graven images, not to do anything. That, that Jesus hit this point, and here's what's happening here. We'll see that Jesus' reply to sell everything is often looked at because of material stuff. We'll say, go sell, distribute, follow. Folks, I know rich people that are willing to give away their money at any time. I know that. I personally know people who have a lot of money that love to give it away. I mean, they have hundreds of thousands of dollars saved up in retirement. Millions of dollars. 
And I know it's real easy for them to give it away. I mean, they, I told you about the man in my dad's church that's always letting go of the money. And I know people that don't have that much money that give things. I know people in this church who every time I turn around are willing to give something. I'm concerned. I'd like to give something. I'd like to buy something. So that's even in our own church. That person may not consider themselves wealthy, but they're always willing to share that. That's good. That is awesome. So you see, what's, what's, this young man's problem may not be your problem. But we all have something that we wrestle with. And we've got to make sure we surrender to Jesus. But, but, but it's not always about that. A lot of people teach this passage to try to make it about that. But that's, that's just what was, Jesus was dealing with in this young man's life. And by the way, if you want God to financially prosper you, you want to have $2,000 to give away, do you give away the $2 you have? <laughs> You've got to give away the 2 You're not willing to give away... Give away the two, you're not going to give away two hundred or two thousand or two hundred thousand. But we see here that the man was breaking the three commands listed above. He wasn't putting God as first supreme in his life. He wasn't. He had the problem with the idols, and he was misrepresenting, misrepresenting God. And so, so here's what was happening: the man was breaking the three commands listed above. And Jesus, as God, was giving him a chance to make him God alone. To let go of his idols. To let go of his mask of hypocrisy and integrate God into his life by following God. Not his idea of godliness. I've had people tell me, well, I've done such and such. And I said, well, this is how I'm going to give. I know the church does this, but here's how I'm going to give. You better give the way God said. Yeah, that God doesn't negotiate with us, okay? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve the Lord, but here's how I do this. I hear people that say, you know, I can just worship God just as well on the golf course as I can at church. No, you can't, because you're violating the, the, the commandment about getting together. Now, can you worship God on the golf course? Yeah, you can. Certainly you can, and you should. Can you worship God while hunting? Yes, you can. I'm a terrible hunter. You know what my success in, in hunting has been? I don't even hunt anymore, but it's boom, there it goes. <laughs> boom, there it goes. I've shot at three deer, and they all just kept going. Now, I'd fish a little better than I'd hunt, okay? But, and by the way, I love to fish. I love to, fishing is one of the most fun things I do. It's relaxing. It's, usually there's beauty outside. I want to go again. I do. I'm going to try. I know it's getting a little cool, but I still like to fish. I fish all year round. Uh, yes, you can worship God. You can worship God by watching sports. I see so many spiritual analogies between sports and coaching. I use them a lot in my, my uh, teaching because that's just who I am. I see it all the time. You know, um, I try to use Jesus' approach here. I encourage kids when I coach them, and I lovingly rebuke them. And, you know, you throw the hat every so often. You know, hey, you know, what are you doing? Uh, I do that. But, um, but here's what happens. Jesus left the young man to himself. Jesus didn't chase him. Now, have y'all seen churches chase after people? Oh, we can't let that one go. No, 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 no. Yeah, sometimes we have to let them go if they're not going to follow Jesus. That doesn't mean we, we, we let them go with anger, like, well, that didn't go, I don't care. You know, no, 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 that's not how we do it. Jesus, it says in one place, loved him. You know, he looked on him with love in one of the other Gospels. But the young man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus left the young man to himself. If you won't surrender to Jesus on his terms, he will let you go. And here's the thing about the rich young ruler. There's many a church would have made that old boy a deacon. You know it. Come on, have you had some deacons? Some of you have been to other churches. I can't say I'm going to like that here. But I've had some deacons like the rich young ruler. I think we're good old boys. A lot of good stuff, but they really didn't surrender to Jesus. And that's why you couldn't get them to come to anything more than a Sunday morning service. They never had any, uh, uh, they gave some money. They were businessmen. And so we put them in charge of things. And by the way, nothing wrong with being businessmen and doing things excellently. I was watching a, an African American church this morning, and I like something that the pastor said. He's a pastor I respect. He said, we're going to serve God with excellence. We need to make sure whether it's music, or whatever we're doing, or preaching, or teaching, or whatever we're doing, that we do things with excellence, even though we're small. Nothing wrong with that, but at the same time, being big shot or being... You said, y'all know churches have done that now through the years. And that's why we have the mess we have in many of our churches. But um, 
Here's, what you, here's, here's my admonition to you. Don't let Jesus leave you to yourself. Follow Him. Follow Him. And you say, well, I believe everybody in here has made a profession of faith. And I believe you have. But are you following Jesus? And maybe you're not totally lost. Maybe, maybe you, you have surrendered to Jesus. But somewhere or other, you've slipped in this. You need to come back and follow Jesus. I was watching this one worship service. It was obviously in an African-American community because it was a First Baptist church. It was predominantly black church, black pastor. And I love it that pastor's getting ready to get up and preach. And a young lady runs down here and says, I'm backslidden. I need to get right with God. And so they, they called other people to come down. They had an altar call right then and there. You know, then the pastor gets up and preaches, and they have another one. Okay? But, uh, hey, by the way, it's always okay. God, God's calling you. Come on. I had a, a sort of a Calvinistic Baptist guy that I like to listen to some. And he was an old-time hard kind of preacher. And he said one day he was preaching, and a lady run down and said, I heard him. He said, I knew what she was talking about. She heard the voice of the Spirit drawing her to Jesus, and she surrendered. And she couldn't wait till the end of the service. She came forth and said, I heard him. So if you've heard him, you go follow him. You don't have to wait till the end of the service around here. If you need to make a commitment to Jesus, we'll stop what we're doing and help you with that, okay? So here's the conclusion. There were two more questions asked. Number one was, who then can be saved? Because now we're getting into the teaching. See, the disciples were like, wow, this old boy can't be saved. I don't guess nobody can. Because don't a lot of people think that, in that day and time anyway, they thought that if you had a lot of money, that obviously God had blessed you. And by the way, God does bless people with money. Amen. But some people get it dishonestly too, don't they? That's right. You know, you find out, oh, that old boy, that old deacon was cheating on his taxes or doing some other kind of thing. That's why he's got money. And then it finally comes out, you know. So that's why we have to be careful about these outward things that we look at. So, so they were just wondering, who then can be saved? And uh, those who trust in Jesus and surrender to him are saved. Jesus said that uh, with God, you know, those who were generated by God's grace, nothing is impossible with God. God can save the richest person. He can save the person at the country club. He can save uh, the bank president. He can also save the lowest person on Skid Row. He can save everybody in between. And then Peter asked Jesus, what shall we have if we surrender to Jesus and give him everything? Our money, time, gifts, and talents. What, we, what, what happens if we do that? Well, God will reward us graciously and generously because Jesus said that. That there would be this, some would receive a hundredfold. Some definitely would receive eternal life. But it's our motive for our service that's vital. If Peter served Jesus only because of the promised reward, then he needed to examine his heart and motives. And if that's why you serve Jesus, well, that's not, and I think some people have, and I think that's why even some ministers and preachers who start out well get frustrated with ministry and church and other things. And a lot of times they start steering the church in a way that's wrong because their self-esteem is even tied up with how much something grows today or how big something is or um, you know, how, how financially well the church is doing. And there's a movement in church life away from some of that today. There was a comment on the four, one of the 411 pages where we talked about house churches and things, and there's beginning to be some people that God genuinely, that a gen, people genuinely love God and are trying to find Him, and they've struggled to find Him in some of our churches. I don't mean that everything's bad. I just mean we're certainly not the only ones trying to do it right. There's others that are doing it right. There's some big churches that are doing it right. There's some little churches and some medium-sized ones. Then there's a lot of people, too, that are just pandering to people because they're so panicked. They don't trust in God. They don't hold to Jesus' standard of salvation, and they start lowering the bar. The bar is that the only way we can get to heaven is two ways. One is to be completely perfect and obey the law. And if you, anybody, any of y'all tried to obey God's law? Have you perfectly succeeded? No. no. But does, does that make you run to Jesus and say, I know you told me to do this, but I can't do it. Uh, Augustine, great Augustine, had said that. He had a prayer. And he said, basically, God, uh, you know, basically, and I'm sorry to say it wrong, Bo, you may remember how it goes, but basically, God, um, grant what thou will, and then provide or whatever, what, what we need to do that. In other words, that is, God grants these impossible standards so that we reach them. But I found out that when I reach for a very high standard, I'm even sitting in my business, I have to have some higher goals. 
When I, when I have a goal, now here's what happens. I set a real low goal. I may go here and get above that goal. But if I have this really high goal, I may come short of it. But isn't this a whole lot higher than this? Yeah, sure. It's the same way in your holiness in your life. You're doing this not to earn God's favor because you can't. Okay, that, that, that's one thing. That, that Jesus wasn't asking this young man to do all this to, 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 so that God would love him more. That's, that's not the case. He was revealing that you don't really love God like you think you do. You've got your own idea about this. And that's not okay. You have surrendered to my idea. But if we're like the Apostle Peter, maybe we've done that. We start serving the Lord. But if we're not careful, we can get weary. I think Jimmy Swagger and many other people, I know Jimmy Swagger started with his purest of intentions. He used to pull a trailer around, preaching the gospel. Sometimes Jerry Lee Lewis, his cousin, would let him park it on his property and, and hang out for a while. And Jimmy, seeing Jerry Lee, God, a man, sometimes he'd come back to the Lord, but most of the time he was living a godless, uh, evil life. And here he is prospering, and Jimmy's just barely getting by. I mean, he ain't got a house to live in. You know? It's easy for us to get off track. I don't look down my nose at people like Jimmy. I, I felt the same way at times, you know? as a minister. But, but here's, here's we got to do like Peter, though. We've got to grow from this, how much will I get, that he says here in Matthew 19, to, in Acts 3, 6, when the beggar comes to him and asks for alms, Jesus, he says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I you, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. So we need to be willing to give. It's not what do I get, God, what can I give for you? So today in this passage, I don't know where you fit in this. I don't know. And, and I'm not trying to preach sermons that make you doubt your salvation. That is not what I'm here to do. But the Bible tells us to examine ourselves. Are we like the rich young ruler? Those of you who are listening by the means of internet, have you surrendered to Jesus? Or have you surrendered to your idea of Jesus? That's serious, folks. And I wish I could tell you, you could... And I can't point you in one particular denomination, one particular radio or TV preacher to tell you, listen to this and avoid that one, because there's, you know, in all denominations, there's some great people teaching the truth, Pentecostal, Baptist, Methodist, Independence, and then there's some that are preaching something short of the real gospel. But I believe our nation's in the mess it's in because we've had a lot of people preaching something short of the real gospel. But I do see some younger people God is raising up that are challenging this. So you know me. I like some of the old-time ways and old-time worship and old-time songs. That's okay as long as we keep in the gospel. And by the way, it's okay to do the new songs as long as we're keeping the gospel right and staying with it. So I'm going to ask our musicians to come. And you can stand with us. And they're going to lead us in a song that... I we call it an invitation song, but I might call it more of a, a commitment song. So if you want to come pray, pray. If you want to bow your head and surrender right now, or if you want to talk to me after the worship service. One of you ladies want to talk to Jennifer. Jennifer's available. But Jesus paid it all. Let's surrender to Him. I hear.